John is a dairy nutritionist who got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin with Dr. David Combs. A few years ago, he started working with Rock River Labs in Wisconsin. One of the things that he worked on was the concept of total tract NDF digestibility. So everybody knows what 30 hour uh, NDF digestibility is on your sheet. He's, he and Dr. Combs developed this idea uh, or refined the idea of total tract NDF digestibility. And so it seemed like a good person to ask about some uh, good strategies for actually troubleshooting these high forage diets that a, lot, that a lot of people in Vermont end up using. So thank you for taking the time today, John. Um, a little bit about more about my background. So dairy nutrition, uh, have done some consulting in the past. I've done some work in North and South America as well as Australia. My dad and his two brothers actually dairy in Eastern Wisconsin, milking about a thousand cows, just over a thousand. But I, I, I do enjoy having my, my roots pretty practically grounded uh, or buried here on that, this third generation German and Italian immigrant uh, dairy. So I, I did then have the pleasure of taking those practical roots and having opportunity through uh, more or less just networking. I'm not the smartest guy on the planet, but working in a plant breeding program, actually earning a master's in plant breeding and then uh, matching that with, with animal nutrition and then carrying on, carrying on and doing doctorate work, uh, focusing on fiber digestion to complement some of the work I'd done on, on starch. Uh, I guess carbohydrates overall in, in dairy and animal nutrition are my forte from an academic standpoint. I've also had interest recently in other aspects of forage uh, and animal nutrition, more so uh, forage health as far as how clean forage is, but we're not gonna get into that today. That might be a topic for some future discussion. What we'll get into over the next, uh, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, hopefully we have some great conversation. I've got slides as a backdrop. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting nutrition programs, finding some opportunity, uh, potentially unlocking the, the forage and the TMR. High forage, in theory, 60, 70, or greater percent uh, of the diet fed to, to ruminants, dairy primarily is where I'll, I'll focus, can be a great thing from an animal health uh, performance and, and dairy margin standpoint, but it, it doesn't always lead to uh, or we don't always get the performance we're looking for so what kind of things might might be holding us back ultimately that we need money to pay the bills some of these theories and concepts are great in discussion but we need to be reflecting back on uh, some concepts that do ultimately relate to dairy farm and dairy business or or uh, over uh, feedlot or, or other farm profitability and so what I've got up here, and I, I like doing this to start uh, the seminars that I lead with, is, is set our sights on, on really why are we discussing topics today, and, and it relates to profitability. So that here we're looking back from January 2004 to October 2015, and, and what I've got here adapted from a, a weekly newsletter I get, Margin Smart, available here at marginsmart.com for no charge. You can see... Uh, zero here is so this is when a dairy farm would break even this is an example dairy farm and so if the, this red line is uh, above here that means uh, a dairy is profitable uh, when the red line is below this line that means a dairy farm is not profitable not having enough money to pay the bills stressful situation as you can imagine uh, not real good so we, what the first thing I draw from this is, is a lot of variation over the years we had a pretty tough time actually I, I finished up grad school right about here so I don't know if I'll call this cause and effect but this is how I started out in the industry with uh, an extremely tough challenging time so this this may be the gazer effect but then we got back as I learned more the industry uh, climbed back into profitability and we had some very very profitable times uh, over the past couple years but then we've trended back towards break even and now, unfortunately, we're plunging back down and hopefully is in a situation like this. But right now, the U.S. dollar is quite strong. And commodities are cheap, which is great for us buying gas, but it's awful for producers uh, on the farm level, whether it be grains or proteins, uh, meaning meat uh, or, or dairy. And now 
that was reflecting back on the past number of years. This is now looking forward, similar concept, uh, break even, and then looking out into the, the next calendar month based on futures prices that are out there for corn and beans. And it's not forecasted really to, to be all that great. This sample farm over the past, uh, I guess, late January futures prices, you can see ranging uh, at this point between minus probably 225 and getting close to break even uh, value dollars per hundred weight, but unfortunately in the red this entire year. But we want to be able to move this bar up and we can do that through some of the concepts we're talking about today, through, through feeding more forage, uh, unlocking the potential of forage. We can uh, cut our costs, our input costs, and, and hopefully move this margin. Uh, cows know good forage. Anybody seen uh, fence line feeding like this in the past? Okay, it's still common practice in Australia. So this was a picture I got out of Australia and it was uh, earth shattering to me in my mid thirties, not having seen anything like this in the upper Midwest prior to that. But cows no good forage. This girl is willing to risk electric shock here to go in and, and get this higher quality feed that is probably a bit more effectively preserved than the stuff that's on the top that's been spoiled just like uh, food sitting out on your counter for 10 days. Unfortunately, uh, what we do now on, on most dairies, uh, grazing with a PMR or uh, in a TMR situation, feeding fermented forages, is we take all of this forage, ensiled forage or baled hay, and we, we do a great job in blending it all up and then distributing it evenly. So we, we need the blend so that we can have even distribution of nutrients, minerals, vitamins throughout the TMR so that every cow has opportunity for, for awesome nutrition. But then we also blend up some challenging parts of the forage that are maybe up here. So one of the things right away that can get into and we can talk about as far as robbing uh, the TMR, maybe a high forage ration of performance, anti-nutrition factors that, that just disrupt rumen metabolism. So what are we really putting in front of cows? Ultimately, we want to get every bit of energy out of every pound of total ration that's uh, in front of them. But when we're not getting all that energy, when we're not getting the type of performance that we expect, what do we look into? So I like to look at several aspects uh, of nutrition. I have opportunity to support dairies on farm and consultants, uh, interact remotely like this quite a bit, do some teaching here at the University of Wisconsin. Um, please don't hold that against me. But ultimately, we need to make sure, first and foremost, that, that the feed is actually there. So we can have the best ration possible. Uh, this is a dairy I actually work with and do a little bit of consulting for. And you can see we are uh, not able to diagnose really any opportunities with the TMR because it doesn't exist. So the first thing I'll, I'll challenge you all to do is, is just ensure that either your farm or your client's farms, are we adequately feeding the diet? Are we keeping it evenly distributed? Are we keeping the ration pushed up? Any questions around TMR management? Uh, I got one. Percentage of refusals, what's a good goal to hit there? It, it depends on a couple things. That's a good answer from an academic, right? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> If, if you're feeding, if you're feeding two to three times a day, or you have a very aggressive push-up strategy where you're pushing up every hour uh, to every half hour, or maybe there's some Lele robots out there that are doing pretty aggressive push-ups, or maybe some other strategies, I think we can get away with as little as two percent, one to two percent. Um, so by the end of the day, where it might look something like this. But with the average dairy uh, or feedlot that I support and, and what I typically see out there for, for TMR management, meaning how we're pushing up and, and feeding and distribution, I, I think three to 5% is probably a more realistic goal, particularly, I guess, thinking about moisture, checking moisture also on a, a pretty routine basis, a one to two unit change in moisture for whatever reason. I mean, we I, flying out of Binghamton this morning, and I understand you guys being just a little bit north of that, we got pounded over the last few days with, with some water. So feeding is uh, water in both rain and, and snow. Feeding is a, a, an art sometimes as much as, as it is in a, a science. So if we're trying to feed to 1%, 2% refusals and we get rain events, uh, we can really, I think, uh, shortchange animals of nutrition that can subsequently 
carry on for several days? It's a good question. Other questions in regards to feeding management. This is an area of animal nutrition that uh, Tom, Dr. Tom Olberg and some others have done a really good job. There are a lot of opportunities as far as just determining is the TMR mixing feed efficiently? Are we really distributing what we think we are? Are the weights of the different ingredients really what we think they are? Uh, we, we tend to purchase a, a TMR and then just assume things are great for year after year. And uh, we, we've saw, I've seen and been part of some situations where we've found some pretty uh, stark uh, differences like maybe from what the, the new or newer original TMR as far as the scale uh, and, and ability to mix feed. So in just ensuring that we're putting the, the, the ration together like we think it should be on paper. That'd be a spot to investigate. And Dan, one we didn't really even talk about uh, with the prior meeting. We went on a different tangent. Okay, so also beyond the formulated diet, meaning the, the ration from the consultant or nutritionist on paper, um, I'll mention a little bit about some of the anti-nutrition factors uh, and, and maybe some other things that are coming from the field. Um, I, I do want it with Dan having... Uh, some agronomic experience I had to put a plug in there because uh, nutrition really starts at the at the soil in the field we don't uh, as in the agronomic and, and animal nutrition worlds talk enough I appreciate Dan uh, while I haven't met you yet in person look forward to that at some point appreciate the opportunity to connect the two programs it's something I'm I'm looking at and, and working to do a bit more in the Midwest and, and now that we have an office and a laboratory in Binghamton uh, opening next week I look forward to hopefully bringing some of that to the Northeast as well, but recognizing that, uh, that soil nutrition, uh, ultimately the, the plants health plant tissue, uh, or the, the plants nutrition will, will ultimately carry on into to forage quality. I do want to mention that a variety of grass or alfalfa, primarily grass up your way or seed selection on the corn side will have a big impact on resulting forage quality. And then ultimately how much forage we can feed within the diet. Um, Genetics are a bit more important on the seed corn side uh, because there, there's a little bit less we can do from a management standpoint to, for example, improve fiber digestibility relative to what we can do with grasses. Uh, that can be a little bit more management driven uh, just as far as harvesting at, at different maturity stages, uh, which is this point right here. When it relates to harvest decisions, how we manage harvest, making sure we harvest forages before they uh, on the grass and alfalfa side get into a reproductive state uh, because when that, that plant goes reproductive forage quality tends to pretty dramatically drop off and and that's going to detract from then how much forage we can feed uh, in the ration because the, the fiber becomes more rigid and the, the cows just aren't able to, to do as good of a job with it we can't get the digestion we can't get the intakes i mentioned silage preservation uh, a little bit ago this is an area where as an industry, uh, dairy and beef, we don't know nearly as much as we should. So there are some great companies out there uh, like Chris Hansen, uh, like Lalamond, um, Alltech's doing some work in this area. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm missing a, a couple others, Kim in and, and some others. But when it comes to harvesting a hundred ton out of the field, how many of those hundred ton are we actually feeding out? Uh, there, there is shrink that's happening. I've, I've done some research in this area. It's somewhere between probably uh, one to two units of shrink and up to maybe 30 tons that we're losing just through ensiling in the silo. So that, that can be a challenge right there. Uh, and then there are also just piles of, of bacteria and yeast and, and different molds that we harvest from the field. If we have a fair bit of soil contamination, maybe we get a bit aggressive with our rakes and things like things uh, in harvest or we're using a disc vine and, and chop off some molehills, which never happens or gopher mounds that never happens. Um, those can lead to, to problems then in stability and actually how efficient, uh, efficient that silage is preserved. Uh, learning a lot about bacterial contamination, silage health. So do we have potentially good quality forage that maybe has bacteria or, you know, think of a food, food poisoning, uh, food poisoning events. Unfortunately, my wife went through that this past weekend uh, when, when we actually got out on a date. She, it was, we had great food. It was a great dinner. 
that the entire experience was ruined six to eight hours after the fact because of some anti-nutrition. So is that something that's potentially happening with TMRs where we've got on, on paper a, a good forage analysis from hopefully Rock River Laboratory, but that we're just not getting the performance? Is it because of something outside of the fiber digestibility, mm -hmm. starch digestibility, uh, maybe like a clostridia or some salmonella or something that is challenging the animal's GI tract and just not allowing her to, to really digest food. Questions uh, in this area, is there some experience here? I wanna be careful not to go too deeply because we could spend hours there, but. Has uh, anybody already been using binders at any point to try to pull down toxins that you suspect or have you really never done that? Nope. No, not really. Do you see many people do it using binders to get rid of some of these anti-nutrition factors uh, or, or not? Yeah, and, and when we talk anti-nutrition factors, I don't know if I had a slide on this. Here I go jumping around. I guess not, sorry. Yeah. I'm taking you through the whole PowerPoint. Um, if you don't feel sick yet, just I'm almost here. All right. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I've talked over the past two to three months, talked a lot about mold, yeast, mycotoxins. And when I look at anti-nutrition factors, mycotoxins tend to, tends to be the hot topic because it's, a, I think, a little bit better understood than some of these other bacterial yeast things that are happening in feed that don't necessarily create mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are fungal derivatives that uh, produce a, a specific toxic event in the animal. And I've learned that it can be a uh, challenge to the rumen health. It can be challenged to the gut health. It can be challenges to the immune system, actually neurological effects. So yeah, binders have been, and there's been multiple different binders uh, that are being fed. But yeah, I'd, I'd say those are pretty common at the moment. Um, I would say more common than not, actually, uh, something like a, a yeast cell wall or a, a clay, a silicate to, to tie up potential mycotoxins in feed. Uh, so if you're not feeding those, um, you know, maybe there's some opportunity there. I, I'm not an advocate for, for just spending money to spend money, but, but just if we're not getting the performance out of the high forage diet, maybe that's something that, that should be looked into. Well, yeah, and I, I often, <clears throat> when I talk, um, on agronomy topics, I often focus on low-hanging fruit. So I don't, you know, if it seems like that there are other things that are bigger deals in high forage diets that might not be the first thing to run to. Yeah, it would probably be second or third, but this can sometimes be visibly uh, assessed on farm. I mean, any visibly deteriorated feed is going to be a cue for me first and foremost. And then Beyond that, there, there are situations where some of these factors, these anti-nutrition factors uh, can arise in feed that looks visibly clean because the, the mycotoxins, for example, or, or maybe some clostridia are actually born in the field and then preservation stabilizes some of these, but, but then they are um, inherent and actually getting fed off. I have a quick question. Yeah, question. Um, just your quick thoughts on inoculants for silage preservation and feed out? I would be putting an inoculant on, on all fermented feeds. Okay. Yeah, and, and a research proven one at that. Um, there are such odd things that can happen during, during fermentation and preservation and relying on the natural bacteria that are out on the crop, which even on your same, uh, your farm, year in, year out, or even month in, month out, that natural population of bacteria out there is going to change and ebb and flow. Uh, to, to leave that preservation process with the value of the crop, especially if we want to be feeding 60 to 80 percent forage, to leave it somewhat uncontrolled, I, I do not think is a, good, uh, is a good decision. I would suggest the investment of somewhere between 40 and maybe a dollar per ton is well worth it. Uh, not only in typically the return on investment can happen through reducing shrink. Uh, if you believe some of the research numbers, it's tough to see that on farm. But then also I've learned over and over again that uh, dr quickly driving the, the pH of the forage, whatever it is, grass or corn silage, lower than uh, four and a half to four, depending on the crop, it is going to do a better job at reducing some of this bacterial and yeast load 
We can even slightly reduce mycotoxins in some cases, uh, contamination coming from the field with a really good and aggressive fermentation. So uh, I'm, I'm all for a, a good lactic acid bacterial inoculant. So uh, there are a couple other preservatives out there that aren't bacterial in nature that actually can do a pretty good job. Your food grade type preservatives that are antimicrobial in nature, uh, they, they can be pretty effective as well. What pH are you guys seeing in your haylage? I don't know, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something that got me though is you said a forty cents to a dollar a ton. Yeah. Because we were we got quoted a dollar a ton, and with the feed out was a dollar seventy a ton. That's quite a bit more. Yeah, that's that's a that's a little bit higher, I guess. Than it it. it let me qualify that. There, there are a couple products on the market. One would be a lactobacillus buchneri type product where I'd advocate going above a dollar per ton uh, to get the amount of lactobacillus buchneri, which ultimately produces factors that when you feed the silage out, it, it keeps it more stable. It keeps it from heating. Yeah. There, there are two objectives when fermenting feed. One is to ferment it as fast as possible and have it stable quickly. That is using a lactic acid bacteria or one of those other uh, food grade preservatives. But then if we have challenges at feed out, maybe we get yeast growing, uh, which, which ha we have a pretty substantial challenge with in the upper Midwest. That's where lactobacillus buchneri type inoculant at 100 to 400,000 CFUs per gram can come in and, and do a pretty good job. And, and that in those cases, you can get to $1.15 to maybe $1.50, depending on how much buchneri you put on. Yep. Thanks. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll skip then past uh, fermentation uh, or any further discussion there. Appreciate you engaging me a little bit on that. Um, and I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about now are, are the nutrients there uh, as far as just forage analyses. So uh, if you're a consultant or working with a consultant, um, a nutritionist, we forage sample uh, routinely, but what routinely is varies, I've found quite greatly. So do we have the protein, uh, the carbohydrates and the fat uh, in, in the forage and in the ration really that we think? So this is a, an example of a dairy that I supported in Eastern Wisconsin. This was an article I wrote for Progressive Dairymen discussing uh, nutrient variability. And um, I wanna, uh, this dairy is pretty aggressive with how they sample forages. So take what I'm about to show you with a grain of salt, right? I work for a forage lab. Of course, it's a great idea to do twice the amount of samples. <laughs> but but this dairy uh, engaged me, and they sampled corn silage every two weeks. And typically, we think of corn silage as a pretty homogenous crop. It's harvested within a couple-week period of time. It's, it's reasonably consistent relative to grass or alfalfa. But I, I've highlighted, and, and this was a single growing season, so I, I don't know that I can make a, too much of this, but I want to highlight the variation between 21 and 32% starch in this corn silage as a percent of dry matter. And this was, it was 2013 corn silage where we started feeding out. And, and you can just see the variation around this blue smooth line. And it, this was just crazy, which I, I didn't really know what to do with. But ultimately, I, I can relate uh, a five-unit change in corn silage starch to a pound of corn difference in the ration. So if we went from, for example, 25 to 30, which you can see we did on these forage analyses within a, a couple-week period of time, that would have been a pound of corn in the diet. So are we actually missing some corn that is coming in through our forage in a high forage situation that is then ultimately leading to maybe less starch digestion, maybe less fermentable starch, which then robs the, the rumen of energy needed to get going and carry on and do some fiber digestion? Uh, when nutrient digestion happens, typically it's it's the sugar and starch digestion that happens first, and, and much like ether on your diesel engine, uh, and on these cold weather days, it, it fires the engine up and then the fiber digestion happens later in time, uh, maybe four hours to then over the next 24 hours, fiber digestion progresses and, and carries forward, much like uh, if we have the, the diesel engine then started and eventually warmed up. If we miss out on starch digestion, if we miss out on some sugar digestion up front, that can actually have a negative effect with an interaction then on depressing fiber digestibility 
And with high forage diets, feeding a lot of forage fiber, we need optimal fiber digestion. We spent a fair bit of time uh, on the last webinar discussing starch, which we can uh, get into potentially. I see we're about half hour in now. Um, I will spend a minute talking about some of the other feed that, that's in the ration, not the forage. So anybody want to take a guess to what I've got laid out here in these sandwich bags? Distillers? Yeah, this is distillers grains. So pretty pretty easy visual. This actually was all labeled distillers grains that I was able to find uh, out of our inventory. And so what does the eye tell us? Somebody dried the first one a little too hard. <laughs> yeah, and, and what else do we see uh, as far as particle size, consistency? Wet, dry, yeah. Just a, a wide variety uh, of quality here. Uh, and, and I can assure you that the nutrient contents of these ranged. One thing that I, I hope we do a better job of in the industry uh, going forward is, is making less assumptions about the other ingredients in the, in the TMR beyond forage as far as how consistent they are and getting away from using book values. Again, take what I'm telling you with a grain of salt because I'm a, a forage lab guy or a testing guy. You should test everything. But when I was consulting in the field, I was routinely uh, taking samples of the non-forage feeds that I was feeding more than three pounds of per cow, just so I had some idea, maybe every three months, and actually what I did, I tended to use a, a pretty consistent nutrition program across the farms that I consulted for. So I would, uh, on one visit, take a sample of something from one farm, and then on the next visit, another farm, and take a sample of another ingredient. And so I just had kind of a rotating, uh, continuous average of ingredient profiles on like corn gluten feed, on canola meal, on soy hulls, on distillers grains, things along those lines. And then I would actually use those uh, within my formulation software uh, and I think improved accuracy. But beyond distillers grains, we've recognized variation. Actually, I think that the uh, ethanol industry has done a better job of tightening some of this up compared maybe to with some other suppliers. But I see a lot of variation in corn gluten feed. Uh, wheat mids, uh, soy hulls maybe not as much, uh, canola and soybean meal, there can even be fluctuations in quality. Uh, I, I, and I don't want to question the, the tags and, and uh, specs on these mixes being delivered or these ingredients being delivered, but rather in some cases I think there is maybe more nutrition there than we know about. So questions on, on that aspect of nutrition? Obviously, if fluctuations here then will interact with uh, forages and diet performance. Okay, then we can get into the meat and potatoes now over the next uh, 15, 20, 30 minutes. So I think looking now at carbohydrate metabolism, this is really probably the, the low-hanging fruit that Dan referenced before as to where I would look uh, it, when high forage diets are not working. So what do we have here? Undigested corn. Yep. What else? Long fiber. Yep. Fiber. Yeah, it's not all corn fiber. So here you see some alfalfa or maybe some grass. What else do we see? My wife's kitchen colander. I was at it. Yeah, no, this didn't make it back in, but. I would encourage you all to, in, in you're working with your cattle, you, you may be sleeving cattle, uh, breeding, um, but spend some time uh, maybe with a manure screening washout like this. When we talk about low-hanging fruit and, and finding opportunities, I like to start first at the feed bunk in the forage center, but then move quickly to the transition and then uh, looking at some undigested feed, meaning manure, uh, washing that out and seeing what particles are, are coming through. So here, pretty clear that we're not getting anywhere near the energy from the, the ration that we should be. And um, it, it's interesting because we're, in this case, likely missing out on fiber digestion as well as starch digestion. Why is that? How can we go forward? In this case, it was actually due to the, the starch. We we're missing that quick firing energy, like I was discussing a little bit ago, which, which then hampered our uh, rumen fiber digestion. We just were missing energy overall and diet performance wasn't where it needed to be. Uh, in this case, the dairy said, just feed more corn. It'll all be great. 
which that's not necessarily the, the best situation when we've got a lot of corn coming through like this and, and ultimately feeding turkeys. And this is really quite, uh, quick quick question for people in the room. How many of you have checked the manure like that? Visually or send something in for starch to adjust it or, or for uh, fecal mm -hmm. starch? Go ahead. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. And you. Yeah, thank you. It's the new workshop. Yeah, the new workshop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, Dan, you want to jump to the star uh, starch discussion, the fecal starch? Well, um, I you know you have a pr progression here. I, I think you know continue on your trajectory, and you know maybe you might want to allude to it right now. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't want to scramble your slides here. Well, we can. I'm I'm just fine with scrambling, as you've seen already, jumping forward, jumping back. Yeah. Fecal starch continuing the low-hanging fruit theme is a really, really good tool. So after getting behind cows and seeing something like this, if I had suspicion that starch digestion wasn't what it could be or we could do better, maybe would be holding our, our high forage diet back, uh, recognizing then that uh, this is now a, a slide describing what cows really do with fiber and starch as far as if we feed 10 pounds of fiber uh, or 10 pounds of starch in, in a diet, how much is actually digested. Uh, manure starch or fecal starch is a great indicator of total tract starch digestion. It, it's Just real quick though, um, John, uh, what kind of response have you seen, say you worked with a farm and you discovered, look, it's just the starch digestibility issue, change uh, your particle diameter or whatever, what kind of change in, in milk production have you seen? Five, first? five pounds, five to seven pounds per cow in a situation like this. Yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty big dollars right there. Five pounds at 13 to 15 cents per cow. I mean, that that, that takes a 60, 80 cents of, of uh, margin right there. But it depends. I mean, this, this uh, I'm sorry, this, this herd was probably 85 to 88% starch digestion based on the fecal starch. So with a fecal starch measurement, we, we measure somewhere between zero and 12% fecal starch typically. And then that uh, we have an equation that can then predict total tract starch digestibility. So through cows, out of every 10 pounds we feed, we, we get somewhere around 90 to 95% digestion on average, meaning uh, nine pounds are digested through the cow. The range is about plus or minus 6%. So you can see at that 85, 88% with the, the prior slide, we were kind of on the lower end of the, the bell curve. Uh, then the upper end being 98, 99% is where I'd like us to be. Uh, Jimmy Ferguson uh, at, at Pennsylvania had, had done some good job or has done a good job in the industry looking at some of this historically, never published anything, uh, which was a challenge or, or unfortunately, but really got this on the map for us and he made an assumption that if we gained uh, a unit or two of fecal starch that, that would equate to about a half pound to three quarters of a pound of milk. Um, so fecal starch is a great tool. I have a couple slides relating to that. I can show you the variation we see through the laboratory. Um, but that's specific to total track digestion. Uh, really in where high performing or high forage diets fail uh, or, or where opportunity exists relates back to the rumen. And then focusing in on the rumen here, um, cows are actually digesting 60% of starch within the rumen. So six out of the maybe nine pounds that are digested uh, overall are digested in the rumen. So that's fine. But look at the variation around that. So we have six units of variation total track and 30 units of variation within the rumen. So I think starch is probably and grain is an under scrutinized uh, component of the ration when high forage diets aren't working I, th I think we make some assumptions sometimes that cornmeal is fine ground and fine ground cornmeal is fine ground cornmeal is fine ground cornmeal that's uh, not the case I'm actually doing some research with uh, a colleague of mine from uh, Cooperative Farm Dealers, Dr. Eric Reed, he contributed to this, and then several others uh, from other mills and researchers along with Randy Shaver. We looked at the variation out in the countryside that we see in fine ground corn, and we have seen between 400 micron and up to 1,200 micron average particle size, which equated to between 
I think 60% starch digestion just for that fine ground corn up to about 85% starch digestion for that uh, supposedly similar fine ground corn. So do we know what our cornmeal actually is? That, that would be a good question to ask. If we're feeding uh, our own corn, uh, whether it be high moisture uh, or if we're grinding on farm, again, what, what is the potential? Uh, high moisture corn offers even more variability relative to fine ground corn, partly because of the particle size, but then also partly because of the extent of fermentation. So where, where does that really stack out? Uh, so there are some tools that we can utilize as nutritionists to get an idea of both where the ration and the ingredients are from a starch digestion potential standpoint within the rumen. Questions or thoughts there? This is taking you to the forefront of where the nutrition industry is at. Uh, there's still probably a little bit we have let, yet to learn over the next few years on the starch side. It all makes perfect sense. You've got it. I think we got it. <laughs> okay, and then I'll jump. I'll segue over to the um, fecal starch discussion, just so I can. Oh, there's my kids. That's Sam. That's my little Lucy. Now she's 11 and a heck of a lot fatter than that. <laughs> she's not going to like me saying that uh, in, in probably 12 to 14 years, but. Uh, thinking about corn and what contributes to fecal starch, I, I just want to mention these pictures too. When I was putting together a, a slide set for a, a seed company as I was speaking on starch digestion, it's just amazing what we've bred corn to endure. I mean, what kind of height do we think this elevator has? I, I think that's got to be probably 100 feet because it's probably 20 up to here, maybe 80 to 100 feet. And we expect that to hit this pile, hit this hard pile, and then uh, we don't want any fines in this, and then we also don't want any fines when it goes on a barge and jiggles around for a couple thousand miles down to Brazil or from Brazil up here. So, I mean, you can imagine how hard corn is just because of how we've bred it uh, and how we've wanted to handle it. Through wet milling, we can get a lot, or get rid of a lot of the hardness, but the hardness is, is our enemy from an animal nutrition or a rumen nutrition standpoint. One other thing I'll show you that you can do on farm, you can either do this in the seed corn. I don't recommend chewing on seed corn when it's got seed uh, treatment on it, but we're on the dry grain. You can crack it down the middle and I'll give Pat Hoffman some credit for this. And you see some yellow here relative to the white. Has somebody seen this before? Could you take a stab and, and teach me what the, the yellow is here relative to the white? All right. What, what do you think? Peanut butter over white. The white starch. All right. So somebody says the white is starch. Yeah. starch. Flowery starch. Right. So the white starch, the white is flowery starch. Dan, that guy gets five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> the yellow is also starch. The yellow is vitreous starch, and so this is all starch, but it's it's a little bit different genetics here on these three. You can see a heck of a lot difference in the ratio of the, the yellow to the, the flowery starch here. There's actually a protein that surrounds the starch and creates a crystalline matrix that's just like plastic. And for those of you that have Dixie cups at home in your bathroom or around the kitchen sink, you know there's a, a there's kind of a little waxy type substance within the Dixie cup. Yeah. That is actually the protein that surrounds the starch here. So they'll extract that and they'll line Dixie cups with it. And so how well does water get through that little waxy Dixie cup? <laughs> so how well do you think then the rumen bacteria, which are soluble in water, can get access to the starch that's in this stuff? Pretty tough. So here'd be something else to look at in your seed corn. Do we have genetics that uh, if you can control this, if you, if you can harvest corn and allocate it to ruminants or your animals, do we have corn that looks more like this as opposed to this? Uh, this we, have a, we have a seed salesman in the room. <laughs> do we see, do you Who are you working with? Do you see uh, any of the companies talking about flour endosperm in their yes. corn silage? Yes, everybody is because it's a buzzword. It's a buzzword. Are they doing anything about it or are they? Well, the silage-specific varieties that each company sells or develops to have more flowery starch. So Not necessarily. More to, well, 
supposedly, let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I will give, uh, so seed companies have tremendous resources to evaluate their hybrids through uh, uh, field plots, uh, comparing against competition. Unfortunately, there's not enough sharing of that information. The universities do a decent job of some limiting test, limited testing, but I can tell you there's not a whole lot of information out there at the moment on the starch quality, but I think something simple like this, work with your, your seed representative in the room and, and start to look at some of these things and, and find this type of corn relative to this type of corn. For pushing high forage diets. Extensive fermentation can take out some of this effect and will uh, because this protein is soluble eventually and is chopped up through fermentation but for the first three weeks to maybe even six months if, if fermentation takes a, a while and siling takes a while this corn will not feed anywhere nearly as well as this corn. Uh, Okay, so then back to, to fecal starch, that's one thing you can look at on farm. This is what we see. So if, if you take a manure sample, say from uh, five or 10 cows, depending on the size of your herd, uh, maybe you'll, you'll do rectal, or maybe if you're lazy like me, you'll just scoop uh, off of the barn floor with your wife's uh, or your husband's one cup kitchen ladle. Uh, you, and then get five or 10 of these and Put, a, put them into a calf pail, mix it up well together, and then you can put it in uh, labs, typically provide little screw top plastic containers, fill those about half full, and then seal those with duct tape, please, wherever you send them to. <laughs> if you send them to our competition, don't seal them with duct tape. <laughs> send them to Rock River, please seal them with duct tape. There are microbes that uh, live and breathe within the, within the manure, and, and unfortunately, we've gotten too many of these that have become little manure bombs. So uh, I know often people send in their manure samples just for the manure analysis itself. They're uh, advised to freeze it first. Is that, is that, does that confound anything or is that? Exactly no, the, the only thing it does from a lab standpoint is it slows down the analyses because it's got to be thawed at ambient temperature. There's really not a way to speed up thawing when it gets to us. But I, I think freezing is a, a reasonable plan of action. I actually did some research a couple of years ago looking at fecal starch uh, with samples that took, say, longer than a day or two to get to a laboratory. And fecal starch levels actually continue to decrease because of the living microbes that are in, in manure. So if you freeze the sample, I think you're going to the cow, and you'll have a more accurate result. Good question. So even being now here, I guess I'm missing a year here. I thought I had a newer slide than this, but I can ensure you uh, we've generally decreased in fecal starch, meaning we've gotten better in, in total tract starch digestion as an industry from East Coast to West Coast, but you see a lot of opportunity here yet. I, I really would like to see more and more black dots below this, this red bar, less than 2% of the manure starch. What, which, is, there, is there anything that's too low? I mean, are, if you're below a certain number, are you probably cutting your cows short on starch? What, what do you think about that? Well, so if we get close to 0% starch, uh, one, either we've got exceptional starch digestion, which is, is where I'd want to be, and we found the balance between enough rumen fermentable starch but not excessive rumen fermentable starch, or yes, there could be a situation where we just don't have enough fuel and uh, it, it's just being all, all utilized. So uh, I would then, if we had a 99% starch digestion, a, a less than 1% fecal starch, and butter fat was still or was, uh, you know, above four on a Holstein herd and uh, the performance wasn't there, then I would consider, yeah, maybe we need to feed just a little bit more starch. Good question. The fecal starch measurement itself is then directly reported and output on a graph from a lab, but, but here is a bunch of results over time. You can see now between 80 and 100% total tract starch digestion then from 2011 to I guess mid-2014 mid I had here, now uh, way too old of a slide. Uh, but you can see as fecal starch has gone down, total tract starch digestibility has gone up. But um, here you see the opportunity. And, and remember back, every unit or two we can do better as we go from 90 to 92 to 95. There's probably a pound of milk there. So where are we at? Are we robbing our, our high forage diet? Are we robbing the rumen of the energy needed to even get going on fiber digestion? Further questions? Um, 
we didn't really talk. Uh, are there some feeding corn silage in the room? Uh, there's a seed sales rep. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about then the potential we've talked to corn grains specifically, but also corn silage rumen starch digestion. So fermentation does improve starch digestion, which we discussed and why that happens. But there's, I, we see a tremendous range in corn silage starch digestion uh, within the rumen. We see actually between probably 50 and, and closer to 95 to 100% uh, rumen starch digestion from corn silages. Half of this is uh, genetics and fermentation, then the other half is kernel processing and how good of a job we do beating that, that grain up that's in that uh, whole plant we're chopping up. I thought I had, yeah, I do have a, a discussion on kernel processing score. This would be another low-hanging fruit that I would look at if a uh, high forage diet uh, isn't working very well. This is a, a machine from hell that we have at the laboratory that we put corn silage into this after it's been dried. This thing here is an arm that raises up and then smashes down on this thing and then this whole sieve apparatus jiggles and what we do is the starch then distributes all the way through and uh, it goes from coarse to finer and finer and finer and finest and what we want to see is most of the grain from corn silage uh, in these bottom portions here. So that, that yields kernel processing score. That's that's the instrument that uh, Professor Mertens developed with his graduate student in the past. The uh, This is a, a similar graph to what I showed you previously, just plowing through here and trying to get as much content in front of you now all in the last few minutes. Uh, what we measure is actually the percent of starch that's less than 4.75 millimeters. So when I was uh, having dinner last night with some in Binghamton, I learned that the Northeast loves their guns. So uh, this is equivalent to about a 22 caliber bullet as far as width. And I can ensure you I'm an avid marksman as well, so I'm not offended. But uh, to get you an idea of, of that, the grain that's smaller than a 22 caliber bullet. And so that the percentage of that, the aim here is to get better than probably 70 to 75. And you can see then the range in all the corn silages we see through Rock River Lab over time, uh, now I have a bit more of a, an appropriate slide up to the 2015 uh, corn silage crop. A lot of opportunity here, just in our corn silage starch uh, grain particle size, kernel processing score, sorry. So is this also robbing the rumen of some energy uh, in, in holding back our corn silage potential if we're feeding corn silage? Have you all or some of you looked at kernel processing scores on, on your fermented feed? Have you looked? Have you had it sent in to be checked? I'm not saying, just looked at. Just looked at. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, this it, is our first year with it. Yeah, and I mean, part of it also, I, I know at least on the east side of the state, what, so you have the, the score, but you also have how long it was in the bunk for. Yeah. And I know what, because land is so limited here, Often it doesn't sit in the bunk long enough, so you get hit twice. Um, you know, if, if you don't have it processed well. Yeah, great comment, Dan. Great comment. Mm -hmm. There's there is milk to be gained here. I mean, this is going to directly tie back to starch digestion in the rumen and then fecal starch. Milk to be gained. Milk to be had. Unfortunately, it's a, a retrospective. We can't necessarily go back to a, a silo we have full of, of corn that, that might, or corn silage that might not be where we want it to. But uh, it, when we're harvesting, I think looking at it with, uh, there, there's a test you can do actually just grab a handful of corn on the fly, corn silage, chopped corn, throw it in a bucket of water. The fiber will float. Uh, maybe some of you have done this. You can skim off the fiber, and then you can focus in and look at the grain. It'll all sink in the water. Then you can dump uh, dump that grain through your, your wife's kitchen strainer again and focus on that. But really what I want to see is, let's see, do I have, to put a visual on it, I want to see corn that is really destroyed. That looks like this, coming out of that corn silage. This is another dairy I worked with. So we had a pull-type harvester, brand new, um, was supposedly set up right uh, with a kernel processor, and this is what we saw on the left. And then uh, we did this test, and the, the farm manager thankfully had them make some adjustments, and now this is the starch quality that um, after they, they further cranked down the kernel processing score and made some adjustments that we got to. So that's a great, great test, one that doesn't involve a laboratory. 
just so you know I'm somewhat honest. Well, I, uh, I've heard that there are some products out there that companies are suggesting increases your starch digestibility, some uh, not inoculants necessarily, but uh, I don't know if they're enzymes or what they are. Have you, is there anything like that in the market? Do they work or not? Yeah, so if, if our starch isn't what we want it to be, if our grain's not what we want it to be, uh, amylase is, a, is an enzyme that can break up starch to some extent. And then there are some bacterial additives, some bacterial probiotics that can help out with some hindgut starch digestion, possibly. Uh, there's a lot of claims being made in the industry. There's unfortunately not enough research, excuse me, behind some of the products that are out on the market. So the, the short answer is yes, there are some things that I would look into, uh, whether it be an amylase or whether it be a, a bacterial probiotic type ingredient, uh, maybe a fungal, but I would challenge uh, you all to at least ask for some research and, and hopefully published research, uh, something maybe that the, the university or, or somebody outside of the company, company selling it to you has done or trying to sell it to you has done to maybe verify the, that the, the product can do something. And I, I also would uh, suggest that it's, it's not a slam dunk. As I've done some work working with enzymes, more so uh, enzymes are odd. I don't exactly understand when and where and what situations they work. Sometimes an enzyme, whether it be for fiber or for starch, can come in and, and yield a couple of few pounds of milk. Other situations, uh, whether it's the rumen pH is different or whether the enzyme is not getting distributed the right way or maybe the enzyme doesn't have the right substrate to work on in the TMR, they, they just don't do anything. So when we're talking somewhere between probably uh, five cents and up to maybe 15 cents, depending on the type of products we're discussing, uh, I, I want to do the, as much homework as we can. So just real quick, I know that you're uh, going to run out of time here. Um, tell us a little bit about the uh, total tract NDF digestibility, the, the question about whether grass is grass is grass. Um, when you're trying to pick a, a variety to seed down with and things like that, or deciding sure. that species. Okay, I'll put a plug in for Professor Combs, uh, more so some of my research in the past went into this, but total track NDF digestibility is a concept and a tool that's really gaining steam. Uh, this, this number is an RFQ on steroids, if I can quickly call it that. We make four measurements uh, as, at the laboratory uh, in, in fiber digestion, and then through Professor Combs' rumen model, we output a single total track NDF digestibility number. So in my mind, this result is four times the value of if, if used, uh, used in the past, for example, a 30-hour NDFD. It was a great tool, maybe a 48-hour NDFD. Great tool to get us started and help us differentiate brown midter versus conventional silage, for example, or help us differentiate super high quality grass from maybe below quality grass. But there's been a lot of situations where it, it ne hasn't necessarily helped us really determine exactly how that forage is going to respond. It seems as though, uh, and now have, uh, Professor Combs has three published Journal of Dairy Science studies, this TTNDFD parameter with the four different fiber digestibility measurements that go into it has proven to be quite accurate. And it's, uh, it's comparable across feeds. Um, so it, it's meant to mimic what a, a high performing cow is, is doing with forage. The, the output is, is, um, Basically, all feeds average about 42% fiber digestion through the cow, which is actually very close to what I found here in my research of published studies. And when differentiating grasses, uh, we, we see some that are, are greater than 48% total track NDF digestion, TTNDFD, and some that are less than 36. Uh, so this is a, a number that is simple because it's just one single number but has been pretty well related to animal performance. So this might be something to consider, again, from the lab standpoint, to look at if, uh, if, if we're questioning how high quality is our grass, how much really can we push. If, if we have a 42% TTNDFD or 43 or, uh, heaven forbid, less than 40% TTNDFD, unfortunately, we are just not going to be able to feed as much of that grass uh, because it's going to bulk up and, and not – pass, not digest through the rumen. 
contribute to gut fill. Whereas if we have 48 or some of the higher quality grasses we see, uh, Italian rye grasses, some Timothy brome mixes, uh, where we get even mid 50s, the range in this number is between probably 30 and 60. So maybe you want to write that down. Average is 42. It's as low as 30. It's as high as 60. But when we get above 50, that's then an indicator. We have an awesome feed. We can really push that feed in the ration uh, and continue to capture performance while cutting back on feed costs. Same sort of range uh, for corn salad and alfalfa if, if you're buying in some hay or, or growing any legume on your farm. And it seems as though as we gain or lose TTNDFD between crops or even within a crop between different fields, uh, two to three units when we're feeding a high amount of these forages in the diet tends to, to relate to a pound of milk. And uh, just a quick question, kind of slightly related, I guess. I'm um, just curious to see what you think of length of cut for alfalfa and corn salad on the Midwest. Okay, so run that question back, past me one more time. I, I missed the front end of it. Uh, I'm just looking for a kind of like a guideline to length of cut for alfalfa. Okay, length, length of cut. I, I think it. It depends on the amount of forage we're feeding. If we are feeding um, a high forage diet, there's a lot of forage NDF, we can probably get away at a half to a three quarter inch length of cut on, um, on corn salad, and then alfalfa is gonna be uh, probably three quarter to an inch, a little bit longer than that. If we're feeding a low forage diet, that forage NDF, that forage fiber, is really important for for the rumen mat, and I'd like us to be um, I'd like us to be probably a little bit closer to three quarter to an inch theoretical length of cut on, on corn salad and, and alfalfa. Um, I really don't want to be ever below a half inch uh, unless we are using a pull type with no kernel processor, and, and we have to to do what we can to try and get some some grain processed with the cutter head uh, or the knives. Uh, I, I like to be between three quarter inch and an inch theoretical length to cut. Uh, I'll, I'll further take that and, and verify that with a, a Penn State shaker box. I like to see uh, with corn salad at least 10 to 15 percent on the top screen, ideally 15 to maybe 25 percent on the top screen with corn salad and then with alfalfa salad it's because the, the legume or with grasses that it doesn't always feed into the cutter head straight. We tend to get a little bit more, maybe uh, maybe 20 to 30 percent on that top screen. Good question. Good question. What numbers like with BMR forages. Yeah, I also, so with BMR or with some high, some of the higher quality grasses, cut these longer and longer, or or go as long as we possibly can because the fiber digestion or the fiber is going to break down faster in the room and it's going to be more apt to pass through the room and more quickly. So I think in those cases, even going uh, inch or however far we can go, depending on, on what sort of settings we got uh, are, is going to, going to help us out. There are a lot of situations where we get super, well, not a lot, but in some situations where we get super high quality forage, uh, whether it be a BMR, sorghum sedan or corn silage and then couple that with high quality grasses where this forage just flies through cows and we maintain um, you know maybe performance goes up a little bit but intake also goes up and we don't necessarily gain the efficiency we were looking for uh, in those cases we might even need to come in with some straw uh, which blows my mind but uh, in order to just slow the or, or put that room in together a little bit more stable and, and put a fiber mat together so, um, were you asking what the TTNDFD is like for the BMR typically? Is that, was yeah. that your question? Okay, yeah. So, do you have any observations? So, we see the numbers here for uh, TTNDFD on corn, but what's what difference does it make if it's a BMR versus a nutrient versus just a, a regular corn silage uh, variety? Great question. Thankfully, I have a slide to answer that. So, here would be a 30 hour NDFD. Uh, the BMR is going to be denoted in brown, NDFD ranging between 20 and 90 percent. And then the TTNDFD parameter here, also in brown, and then conventional silage is uh, the bell curve behind that. So you can see we average, uh, we average right about 42 for conventionals, and we average about uh, probably around 46, 48 for 
BMR. So we gain 10% or we gain four units on average with samples that we see that are labeled as BMR. Obviously we don't know truly if they're BMR and then everything not BMR we're labeling conventional. So that's a, a limitation to what I'm looking at here. But typically we see four units. So going from a 42 to a 46. It's quite a range there though. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. So and, as, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's varietal, but not any small parts due to the environment. Oh, and I'll let uh, Dan yourself and, and our seed representative uh, colleague talk about the variation that comes in due to environment. Yeah, in my mind, I think 50% of this is due to the growing conditions and season that then will contribute to some of this overlap. Well, thank you very much, John. Here's my contact information. If any of you want to reach out to me, uh, you're more than welcome. Here's my office phone number.